Dead Rising 2 Off the Record Sandbox mode is a casual version of the original game's Infinity mode. Much like the first Dead Rising Survival mode, Sandbox features crazy survivors roaming the city who won't hesitate to attack Frank on sight, along with many of the psychopaths from the main game. However, I never actually intended to make a video covering this. But I got a few requests when I did do the Infinity Mode video, and I realized that the survivors are pretty dangerous, and while there's no longer a full inventory to look over, their weapon of choice, spawn location, and sometimes even spawn times can have some significance. And knowing that the psychopaths still spawn in this mode, who can lock down an entire area in Sandbox for a full hour real time, I figured it might actually be a helpful video to make. Besides, it's not like anyone else is gonna do it. So I put on my happy face and jump right into it. No way, pal. I'm not here for work. This is my vacation! Sandbox mode starts at 7 a.m. on day one, and the first survivor you'll encounter is Gordon on your way out of the rooftop. He serves a similar role Otis did in the Infinity mode, to introduce the concept of survivors being hostile. As such, unlike most survivors in Fortune City, Gordon is exceptionally weak in this mode. He'll need four regular hits to remove a single block of health. This is likely so players who jump straight in the sandbox mode upon getting the game aren't immediately killed by the first true enemy they encounter. He's armed with a lead pipe, and when defeated drops his bounty. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the Magicians also spawn right away in the Atlantica Casino. Given these two are some of the most dangerous psychopaths and off the record, they serve as a warning that bosses spawn here as well. They're also indicative of how bosses stick to their original locations, but not their original times. Reed will drop his rocket launcher, and Roger drops one of his shimitars. These weapons do not respawn, and defeating Reed will not reward the player with his combo card. The same applies to Slappy with the flamethrower and Shuck with the molotov. Survivors will always drop 10 grand when slain, and Psychopaths will drop 25k. Leaving the area will give any enemy all their health back, unlike story mode where Psychopath health is saved. Hostiles can be killed by zombies and the money will still drop. Also, some weapons like the rocket launcher or the snowball cannon will not be able to damage survivors on impact, but will work just fine on Psychopaths. Finally, Psychopath themes still play, and survivors have a unique theme to play when one is nearby, so use the music to know when you're in danger. Also, while technically neither a survivor nor a psychopath, the looters spawn exclusively in the Palisades Mall. This is always the case in sandbox mode, no matter the time of day or what day it is. Looters die instantly to electricity, so keeping an electric prod or a money hacker on hand is a good idea. Lashandra spawns in the food court at 9am, or 10 minutes into the game mode. She's also armed with a lead pipe, likely to match her husband's weapon of choice, or just to match her own in the story mode. She hits harder, but still isn't too dangerous. Now might be a good time to explain how characters spawn in this mode. Unlike the Infinity mode, where character spawns operate on shifts, survivors will spawn for 10 hours in-game at a time, and psychopaths spawn for 12 hours. This translates to 50 minutes and 1 hour real-time respectfully, with a few exceptions that I'll bring up as they occur. At 10 a.m., Carl will spawn in the Royal Flush Plaza with his full moveset. The shotgun is the only weapon he'll drop when slain, as none of his mail bombs or anything can be picked up. Defeating him will unlock the psychopath clothing if you never beat him in the story mode on that file. It will not give any Zombrex, as Frank doesn't need to worry about turning in sandbox mode. Speaking of Zombrex, at high noon, Chuck Green will spawn in Fortune Park. He won't get knocked off his Slicicle when he's defeated, and he doesn't drop any Molotovs to use either. He can drop Whiskey if you interrupt him in the middle of his healing, but that's actually just a core mechanic of the boss fight. It's possible that the decision to have him spawn after Carl is meant to be a little nod to how Chuck needed Zombrex but could never find any in this game. At the same time as Chuck, Jack will spawn in the Fortune City Arena. He's armed with the Fire Axe and is the first truly aggressive survivor the player will encounter. He only has a 5 hour window, or 25 real life minutes to be beaten, but if you do manage to slay him, you will get his helmet. You'd be forgiven for thinking the doors are shut so the zombies can't get to him before you do, but zombies actually ignore survivors until the player aggros them. It's more likely that this is to hijack from the players themselves by forcing them to actively look for him, since there's really no reason to head here in this mode. In essence, he's an easter egg spawn. This also marks the single longest wait between spawns in the game mode, as the player will need to wait 5 in-game hours before Doris appears in Palisades. 
If I had to guess, this is to ensure that Gordon and the Magicians have time to despawn, in case the player wasn't able to take them out without overloading the map with encounters. Or it could be that Doris is armed with the light machine gun and is shockingly adept at using it, capable of quickly sidestepping the player should they try to shoot back. If starting sandbox mode at level 1, Doris is probably the first survivor players actively try to avoid. However, she will drop her light machine gun if defeated, even if the player already has one in their inventory. This holds true for any weapon that normally has a one at a time rule. There's a couple reasons the game may have given Doris a weapon of this caliber. First is to subvert the idea that she's the weaker gunslinger between her and Chad in story mode. It's also quite possible that they did this to show off the new survivor combat capabilities. As an aside, she's the only lover whose partner isn't found in this mode. 7pm brings Seymour to North Plaza. You have to be careful since he's capable of sniping the player at the hotel entrance with his six shooter if they linger in his line of sight for too long. Thanks to off the record giving bosses glorified iframes, Seymour is much more dangerous here than he is in the base game. He can still shoot guns out of the player's hand, so it's best to stick to melee against him unless you're confident. He'll drop his six shooter when defeated, which can be a good way to deal with survivors or finish off bosses who are giving you trouble. Since none of the Uranus zone bank vaults can be opened in sandbox mode, this is the only way you can get a six shooter, so make sure you nab it before you leave. 10 p.m. has Danny spawn in the Royal Flush Plaza armed with a handgun. It's kind of weird that she spawns after Doris and Seymour in this regard. You would think she'd be a good way to introduce the idea of survivors having guns. Randy can be stunned with a handgun if you shoot him in the crotch during his boss fight, so it's possible that the implication is that Danny used this very gun to get away from him. Although there's an equally real chance it's not meant to be indicative of anything. Danny is the only psychopath hostage that spawns in sandbox mode. I'm not sure why. Midnight of Day 2 has Bill appear in the Atlantica Casino, near the bar facing the Arena Zone entrance. He's armed with a bowie knife. Kinda wish he was armed with a money case instead. I half expected him to actually not drop any money, as if he'd lost it all when gambling. Regardless, Bill marks the start of survivors getting pretty powerful with melee damage, but he's otherwise pretty unremarkable. Royce appears in the Uranus Zone at 2am, in front of the giant robot Stacy uses for that stupid boss fight. He's armed with a broadsword, which could be a joke on having razor-sharp wit as a comedian, but that's a bit of a stretch, even for me. I'm actually curious, why didn't they give him the comedy trophy? You'd think that'd be a nice little easter egg. Summer appears at 5am near the red bike in the Platinum Strip, armed with a plank of wood. There's a morning wood joke, but I'm not sure that's what the devs are going for. On the other hand, Korra being armed with the love tube leaves nothing to the imagination. Don't be fooled, she can deal a full block of damage and knock Frank off balance when hit, making her capable of stun-locking the player. Korra appears at the bar in the Americana Casino at 7am. The massager is likely a joke on her being overly exposed. There's only one other survivor armed with one, but he's not for a while. At the same time, Boykin appears in the underground where he's fought during story mode. He'll drop his LMG when defeated, and the player will earn the soldier outfit if they haven't gotten it yet. Given how he spawns not too long after Doris, it's very possible to hold two to three LMGs when leaving this area. 9am sees Woodrow spawn in the south end of South Plaza, which I'm assuming is meant to be a joke in and of itself, where the underwear store is. He's armed with a machete and is noticeably missing just his jacket. This is because he has a layered outfit thanks to the strip poker minigame, and the devs had a little bit of fun with it. He only spawns for seven hours, but isn't particularly dangerous, no more than anyone else is at this point in sandbox mode, and he doesn't offer any more money when defeated. He's simply a clever little easter egg. At 2pm, Jasper appears outside of Baron Von... Brothos? Uh, the, the bar in the Yucatan Casino. That's the place that has the infinite wine, and is armed with a baseball bat. This could be a nod to him being a bartender, though you'd think they'd put him in the bar proper if that was the case. Honestly, he and Bill should have had their spawn location swapped. Bibby spawns in the Slot Ranch Casino stage at 3pm and is armed with a heavy wrench. Although she's technically a psychopath, she's treated like a survivor. She doesn't have any more health than a normal survivor, only gives $10,000 when defeated, and does not have the iframes. The large wrench could be her trying to fix the stage for her live show, given the objectives of her story mode mission. At the same time as Bibby, Brandon will spawn in the Uranus Zone bathroom. Since the glass shard is not coded as a weapon, Brandon doesn't drop anything besides his $25,000 bounty. Kinda surprised the game didn't have him drop at least a knife as a stand-in. At 4pm, the snipers become active throughout Fortune Park. However, like always, only Big Earl and Johnny will be ready to fight right away. After they fall, Derek will be available, then Dietz. 
Each of them will drop the full $25,000 bounty, as well as their sniper rifle. Interestingly, they also still give prestige points in some versions of the game. This is because the PP is tied to them dying, while other bosses only give PP after their defeat cutscene is finished, which never plays in sandbox mode. I'm not sure what the oversight is, that the snipers were not meant to give PP in sandbox mode, or they forgot to adjust it for other bosses so they could. Eh, probably the former, though. At 9pm, Michael Wu spawns in the knife shop at Palisades, under the effects of Quick Step. This is supposed to be ironic, since his leg would indicate that he's injured. But this isn't true in any version of Dead Rising 2. In the vanilla game, it's the other soldier that's hurt. References aside, his speed paired with the meat cleaver makes him rather dangerous, and it's impossible to avoid him once he's aggroed. He won't stop until either you die, or he does. Or you leave the area. Sivan, the medic, appears in the Fortune City Arena on midnight of Day 3. He's armed with a tomahawk. His appearance in the arena specifically is likely a nod to how most of Dead Rising 2's victims die there. 1AM has Nevada Slim in the Platinum Strip Pawn Shop, armed with a handgun. The pistol could be a reference to the poker phrase, under the gun, a term that's meant to refer to when a player's under pressure to act, and he is canonically supposed to be the best of the three poker players. Chef Antoine spawns in the food court at the same time as Nevada, but I'm not sure if he drops his weapon upon defeat. He still drops the money no problem, but I couldn't find the frying pan when he was defeated, and I'm positive I didn't destroy it. Maybe it fell through the floor. I've had that happen to weapons and off the record across all versions. 3AM sees Janice spawning in the Royal Flush next to the sports car. He definitely looks like the type to own a supercar. He's armed with a crowbar. This could imply that he's trying to break into the car some way, shape, or form, but it could also be a deliberate case of irony. Unlike the crowbar-wielding looters, Janus got his money in the story mode legitimately. Well, as legitimate as slot machine gambling goes, anyway. Nina, the final of the three Guardian Angels, spawns at 4am in South Plaza, where you fight Seymour. She's armed with a sledgehammer and will take off two blocks of hell to swing. So, unless you're trying to get a good picture of her for a thumbnail, take her seriously as a threat. One weird thing about the three Guardian Angels is that they can perform advanced attacks, like the Double Lariat, or the Heavy Attack, when unarmed. Yet they never take advantage of that in sandbox mode. It might be because those moves are too slow to work against the player, as they were meant to make it so the ladies were unable to be grappled by zombies, rather than dealing raw damage. This also makes these three ladies the only time all the survivors of a large group actually spawn in sandbox mode. I guess the devs have a favorite, and I can't blame them. Randolph the Artist spawns at 6am in the Uranus Zone, at the UFO drop site to be exact. He's armed with a paint can, a clever nod to his profession, and he's in one of the more sinister locations. On one hand, the only way to get to him with melee weapons is to lift or destroy the barricade, making it easy for him to land a few hits and do some serious damage. On the other hand, if you have a gun, he literally can't do anything besides occasionally jump back if you decide to shoot him. At 8am, Slappy will start to stalk the Palisades. He'll only drop one of his flamethrowers when killed, but there's a bug that I wasn't able to capture, but I've seen firsthand several times. If Slappy is killed in sandbox mode while the flamethrower is still spewing fire, his corpse will endlessly have fire coming out of the flamethrower, which can actually hurt Frank if he touches it. This can only happen to the right flamethrower, since it's the left one that is dropped. 9am sees Elrod spawn in the barbecue shop at the Americana Casino, Although I find his weapon of choice being the black electric guitar to be... strange. You'd think they would go with the acoustic guitar instead. Maybe it was actually meant to be the American flag electric guitar design, and the game just spawns the wrong one. At high noon in Fortune Park, near the Uranus Zone entrance, and roughly where you would find the chainsaw on the floor, Alan of the Rock Trio will spawn with an assault rifle. He's not quite as dangerous as Doris is, but the assault rifle doesn't need to land a full burst to take off a block of health. He was likely chosen over his bandmates simply because of how metal his design is. Skyler, of all people, appears in the Yucatan Casino with a tiki torch at 3pm by the escalators. Given that he also appears in the story mode to save Frank should he die during the opening, was supposed to have a cutscene in Vanilla Dead Rising 2, and appears in cutscenes for when the player achieves overtime mode, I guess he's a developer favorite of the safe house crew. Trixie Lynn spawns in the Atlantica Casino at 6pm with a brass stand. There's a possible joke with her spawn location. At the parkside entrance, there's a lot of fish in the water, and given that Trixie is less than devoted to Elrod, this could be a plenty of fish in the sea joke. But it's just as likely that she's put there, so that way if she starts beating the ever-living hell out of you, you can run away. 
Yeah, unless you're willing to abuse the Blast Frequency Gun to make her sick, which works on all survivors, by the way, she can very easily kill you. Don't underestimate her. I've actually died a few times getting cocky. The final proper psychopath of Sandbox Mode spawns at 6pm, Randy. A deceased Danny can be found in the Wedding Chapel, but the fight plays out as normal. I'm not sure why he's saved for last. My only guess is that since Sandbox Mode isn't great for leveling up, they maybe wanted to save him for later. But you could argue that for literally any given psychopath. As an aside, the chapel is unlocked the entire time in Sandbox Mode. You don't need to wait for him to spawn if you want to get the psychopath mask in there. 8pm has Chris spawn in the Palisades. He's the Terra is Reality contestant who only wears a towel. He's also the only other survivor armed with the massager. As the game saves the love tube for the two most exposed characters in the game, Chris and Cora, respectively. Chris takes a full two blocks off per whack, making him a lethal joke enemy in the mode. At the same time, Willa spawns on the second floor in the center of the Royal Flush Plaza, armed with a frying pan. Her aggression is maxed out in deliberate contrast of story mode, where she's completely incapable of combat. As such, Willa can easily juggle the player while zombies quickly surround him. She's far and away one of the most dangerous survivors you'll encounter. However, at 11 p.m., the single most dangerous character in sandbox mode appears. In the Silver Strip, between the diner and the movie theater, Rebecca Chang will spawn. Unlike other survivors, Rebecca uses her often unheard line for defection. You bastard. She is armed with a light machine gun and never lets up on the gunfire. She has 2,000 points of health, roughly 20 blocks worth, making her almost as durable as a psychopath. She can still be stunlocked with the BFG like other survivors, but Rebecca is easily the most dangerous character in the game to be caught unprepared for. Because of this, unlike other survivors, her bounty is slightly higher at 15,000. Rebecca spawns until 6am on day 4. Once the clock strikes 7am, the game circles back around to day 1, bringing the spawn rotation back to Gordon and the Magicians. Finally, the twins spawn for the mission Double Trouble. Just like in story mode, the player only needs to defeat one of them. Once one is slain, both will despawn and the mission is cleared. The defeated twin will drop the $25,000 bounty, on top of any prize money the player may have earned from the challenge. But she'll despawn before the animation finishes, and thus never drops the katana sword, making it unobtainable in sandbox mode. Finally, the twins spawn for the mission Double Trouble. Just like in story mode, the player only needs to defeat one of them. Once one is slain, both will despawn and the mission is cleared. The defeated twin will drop the $25,000 bounty, on top of any prize money the player may have earned from the challenge. But she'll despawn before the animation finishes, and thus never drops the katana sword, making it unobtainable in sandbox mode. A lot of characters just don't appear in this mode. The missing psychopaths are Evan the Clown, Stacy, Ted, Snowflake, TK, and Sullivan from Dead Rising 2. Also, any cut characters from Dead Rising 2, anyone from the two downloadable games, any unsavable survivors, and any new survivors added and off the record do not appear here. That last part is the weirdest of the Brado missions, but it could just show how late into development those missions were added. This is backed up by how cut missions from Dead Rising 2 still have text files in the game. But even just looking at the returning characters from Dead Rising 2 Vanilla, there are some weird exclusions. Tammy makes sense because she can't move at all, but Tamara isn't used despite being about as prominent in cutscenes as Skylar is. Denise and Luz don't appear, and I thought at first it was because of their extra large health pools, but Michael and Rebecca had their health pools reduced for sandbox mode, so that can't be it. Christine doesn't appear drunk nor sober, Jared isn't here alive or undead, and the underdressed Europa and Lynette don't appear at all. Richard, Esther, and neither of the pains appear either. Most confoundingly of all for me, though, is that no one from Brains Over Bronze nor Tape It or Die have a single representative. Off the record, had over 100 unique survivors and barely used 30 of them. But why? I can't pretend to know the full ins and outs of development, but I have a guess. Time. Off the record was made in roughly 6 months at most, making use of the many ideas the base game didn't have time for. But you can see that lack of time they had with both story mode and sandbox mode. Story mode can wait for another day, but sandbox mode doesn't have its own day counter like the infinity mode did, it loops around on its own 24 hour cycle. But if that's the case, why not cut the survivor shifts down to 25 minutes and or double up on the survivors that spawn at a time? 
That's because sandbox mode was made for the more casual side of the Dead Rising fanbase. Now, I'm not trying to say it's a clean 50-50 split on this or that there's no overlap. In fact, sandbox mode is easily the best compromise we've gotten between those who prefer Dead Rising's time limit and those who tolerate it. But that divide does exist. And since the player can jump right in the sandbox mode from level 1, and several players never touch the story mode and off the record, would it be wise to have constantly spawning hostile enemies attack and possibly kill low-level players? After all, sandbox mode doesn't offer many ways to level up, and the survivors are just a nod to the more hardcore infinity mode, which sandbox mode is not aiming to recreate. If it was a choice to spawn a fairly limited amount of survivors, it's one I can understand them making. My problem is the bounty system. And off the record, everything costs more money, but you earn more money from basically all sources, so inflation hit Fortune City pretty hard. But this means that the 10 grand you get for each survivor you defeat isn't all that significant. Smashing open two ATMs will net you the same amount, and ATMs always come in pairs of two. The Psychopaths dropping 25,000 isn't much better. A single ATM with a money hacker drops 20k, and again, they come in pairs, so that's 40k. And since looters now wield money hackers and always spawn in the Palisades, it's very easy to have infinite money and off the record. Survivors and Psychopaths should have given PP when defeated, since sandbox mode it lacks proper side quest, and therefore doesn't have any reliable way to level up Frank beyond mass killing zombies. But in the end, it's not that important. The survivors are not meant to be the main draw of the mode, they're just a nice little addition. My criticism of the survivors are really an extension of my issue with sandbox mode itself. There's not really much to do beyond experimentation in the challenges.